In the beginning, darkness was on the face of the earth. And God said, let there be light. And God created creatures of every kind. But humanity has exploited his creation in the name of the almighty dollar. Until today, thousands of species are on the brink of extinction. But there are those who are acting to save endangered species before it's too late. Since time began, man has taken God at his word and done exactly what he wanted with the planet. More often than not, the mighty dollar, not God, has been the driving force. The love of money has resulted in some of the worst evil inflicted on Mother Earth and the creatures living on her. Thousands of years, humanity has raped the land and exploited the animals, taken from it whatever was wanted, without a please or thank you, without thought of the consequences. But in the late 60s, changes of attitude began, changes which give great hope for future generations. Two, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. 1969, and Apollo 11 clears the launch pad, heading for the moon. And for the first time, man will walk on extraterrestrial soil. Again. Eagle, you're looking great. Coming up nine minutes. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. And quality base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Those words from astronaut Neil Armstrong in the Sea of Tranquility echoed around the world as one billion people looked on in wonder. But in fact, it may have been a greater step for mankind than Neil Armstrong could ever have imagined. As the Earth rose over the moon, for the first time, many people were able to see our world in the greater scheme of things and recognize just how fragile it really is. And it's this, some believe, which led many ordinary people to wake up to our all-consuming society and realize the damage we're doing to our Earth. Since that historic day, there has been a universal awakening. An environmental revolution has taken place. Born out of the 60s free thinking, Greenpeace became the flagship of the world's conservation movement. Now, our attitudes have changed so much Ordinary people are doing extraordinary things in the name of humanity and in the name of life. One of those things happened here on a beach in Western Australia when a pod of false killer whales became stranded. Why? Nobody really knows why, though there are plenty of theories and we'll be looking at some of those later. But what we do know is more than 1,000 people came to this remote beach to save those whales. In all, 90 were stranded. Sadly, only 33 were saved. The rest are buried here, below my feet. The whales have been discovered on a beach near the town of Augusta in the southwest of Western Australia. They had been on the shore for at least 24 hours, and if any of the animals were to be saved, volunteers had to move quickly. But before they even started, the odds were against them. 
The very remoteness of the stranding posed major problems. There was no road into the site, and while a convoy of small four-wheel drive vehicles forced its way through, others walked the long mile or so from the nearest road. However, before the rescuers got to the beach, things began to go wrong. Vehicles became bogged and volunteers had to rally together to dig, push and pull them out of the wet, crawling sand. Once on the beach, it was a sorry, eerie sight. People's hearts leapt to their mouths as they caught sight of the stranded animals. And at first, dismay set in at the thought of the mammoth task ahead. More than 60 of the huge black animals were lying on the beach. There was no sound save that of the surf as it crashed against their weakened bodies and the noise they made as they gasped for air. Some had already drowned, buried in shallow graves. They were unable to lift their heads above the water which ordinarily gives them life. If you feel that you want to go down, come back and check it out with me anyway, OK? The men charged with overseeing the rescue were wildlife officers from CALM, the West Australian Department of Conservation and Land Management. At the moment we're going to keep them as comfortable as we can overnight, uh, keep their blowholes clear, uh, keep them comfortable, and in the morning we'll have to uh, transport them along the beach to a place where we can get them out. You don't seem to have many volunteers here at the moment. Well, it's been, uh, as you can see by the difficulty of the access in here, that uh, it's been... <laughs> The track that we came in on, if uh, we use that too much, we're going to lose that track anyway. So it's had to be fairly well coordinated so that uh, we've got a chance of having volunteers here when we need them. Yeah. And uh, we will have the number of volunteers we need to uh, see them through the night anyway. Nevertheless, at this stage, volunteers were a scarce resource. Yeah, Terry, there's 14 still left at the control point. Um, if you leave those, those five there that are dry, Send the two girls that are wet down here and uh, we'll send another five to you now over. So if this rescue was to succeed, those people who had travelled so far to pull these suffering creatures from an otherwise watery grave would have to be encouraged, nurtured and looked after with as much care as the animals they were trying to save. Despite their efforts, the sea had claimed at least 19 of these gentle giants, and the volunteers had an uphill battle ahead of them. An all-night vigil was mounted as the whale savers united in a common cause. Rescuers will have their work cut out for them when dawn eventually comes. Not only is bad weather forecast, but it's said there's a huge school of sharks out there just waiting. dawn broke, the full extent of the tragedy could be seen. Dozens of animals rejected by the sea like unwanted playthings along the beach. Black, sorrowful objects. Some lifeless. Others just hanging on.
Rescuers continued to make them as comfortable as they could, rocking them like babies, patting them, talking to them. I'm determined it's going to survive. Yeah, we're going to pull her through because, you know, she's a living thing and everything deserves to be given a chance. I'm extremely attached to her <laughs> and just noticed lately that every different whale has a personality quite, you know, different to the other. Like, um, take her for instance, I spent all night working with her and she's <laughs> a heck of a lot different to this one, yeah. A lot of stress, a lot of stress marks on their skin where they're drying out and they on the tail where they're continually moving like that and the skin's drying, it's cracking and splitting. So they're obviously... But that, those things are only superficial. I believe the, uh, the weight on their stomachs is what will actually kill them if they're going to die. And die many of them did. But most of the whales had made it through the first night. And as the surf continued to smash against them, the weather began to change for the worse. The surviving whales had to be marked and made ready for immediate transportation to a safer beach. But what chance did the whales really have of surviving? And what chance did the handful of people have of successfully saving scores of stranded whales? Being there on the beach, I couldn't help but wonder at the impossibility of it all. With each of the poor creatures weighing around half a ton, the enormity of the task ahead was almost overwhelming. Nick Gales was the vet in charge of the rescue and admits the odds were against them. They're an animal that live in a, in a um, completely zero gravity world. They're not built to withstand gravity. They find themselves on the beach and all of a sudden the, uh, the physical weight of the animal um, causes all of this damage and what happens is they can be pounded in so there's a physical beating as they come in on the beach but once they're stationary on the beach all the pressure of their, their weight on, on their muscles causes very serious damage to the muscles and there's a lot of enzymes that are released when that damage occurs and we can see high levels of those enzymes that show that and essentially what can happen is that they, they die from this sort of toxic overload within their body from, from just the, uh, the physical weight of the animal. Despite this the volunteers were determined to succeed and it was this determination which was their best resource but determination alone couldn't shift these mighty creatures. Locals brought in heavy lifting gear and trucks of all shapes and sizes to help with the evacuation. And the battle to save these lost angels, as someone called them, was on. They live in a, a water environment where they've got to cope with a lot of heat loss because water uh, conducts heat. It's about 20 times better than air. And that heat isn't being conducted away from them. You know, add to that a, a warm day and this fabulous adaption they have of their blubber really is counterproductive when they're on the beach and they can just overheat terribly and, uh, and die from hypothermia. There are uh, people who believe that it's pointless releasing them if they've been on the beach more than a few hours because whilst they may swim away, all of those toxins from the, the breakdown of the muscle tissues eventually cause the kidneys to cease functioning and the animals die three or four days after being released. So we, you know, we have to look at that as well. By now, most people were beginning to ask the question, why? Why did it happen and why in such large numbers? There are numerous theories, like the beachings are caused by the Earth's magnetic forces. Some believe sunspots or the moon affects the animal's navigation. But the most accepted is one or two animals become sick and strand themselves and the rest of the pod try to help their stricken friends. John Bannister is curator of the WA Museum and says this is the most likely theory. Well, these animals being oceanic, they're out of their element for some reason. They come close to the coast, maybe because there are storms at sea or what, the leader or something gets themselves unbalanced or sick or something like that. One of them gets on the beach and then the instinct or the, the decision is they make is to almost instinctively, I suspect, they go to help each other. They land on the beach and that's the end of it. Uh, there is no sort of racial memory in this because in the past all those animals would have died. So it's, it's an accidental thing in that sense. A mass stranding doesn't happen, bang, a hundred whales on the beach. It, it probably, um, you know, it can take, it, well it can happen quickly but it can take 24 hours. They can all be milling around just outside and slowly come in. 
If there is an answer for why whales strand, the answer is that they're extremely social and that they have this very tight so, um, cohesion, social cohesion, and that's why they go in. So the experts agree, the whales beach themselves because of a sick friend, and the only way back to the sea for these caring creatures is a long truck, boat, and trike ride again to a suitable release point. Most of the rescuers would be comfortable with the theory the whales beached themselves in a vain attempt to stay with an injured friend. It fits well with many people's belief that these animals are special. They have feelings and emotions not unlike ours, that they are akin to humanity. It also fits well with other experts like Greenpeace man Roy Fuller, who was there on the day trying to save a whale. There's a, some form of affinity between whales, dolphins and humans. And they seem to recognise us as some form of intelligence and we seem to be able to communicate to, with them um, via our emotions. And he agrees the cause was probably a sick animal which brought the others in. But he asked the question, how did that animal fall sick in the first place? I'm beginning to worry that perhaps pollutants in the oceans are causing these sort of problems. The vibrations I'm getting anyway from this are not good. Roy Fuller has been involved with numerous whale and dolphin rescues and he believes it's the poisons we're injecting into the oceans of the world which cause the animals to become sick in the first place. But he admits he has nothing to back his theory, though it's a fact heavy metals, among other things, build up in mammals' fatty tissues. Dolphins, for instance, it's eight years before they become sexually mature, so the female will not give birth, of course, you know, before that eight years. When its first calf is born, it converts that body fat into breast milk. And that breast milk that is pumped out into that baby dolphin, into that dolphin calf, is laced with PCBs, other pollutants, pesticides and so forth. And he says the firstborn gets the lot. Marine vet Nick Gales agrees. In areas where, where we know there's massive amounts of heavy metals going in, there has been a tie-in found with some dolphins passing over heavy metals to their young, and the firstborn of some species can have real problems because of getting a, a sudden massive burden and, and actually lose the firstborn. But he says he doubts heavy metals or pesticides had anything to do with the Augusta beachings. He says although there may be a problem with some runoff of pesticides and herbicides from local agriculture, he is positive it has no effect on the whales. Well, there were several autopsies done, uh, you know, and other vets as well that were down there, and, and basically we found damage caused by the stranding event, um, which is the, the most critical thing. We found nothing that indicated a, uh, a previous ill health, if you like, that uh, a possible reason for why an animal came in in the first place. But what does have an effect on the whale when it's in trouble is the way humanity rallies to help. He says it never ceases to amaze him how people always turn out. And on this occasion, nearly 1,000 volunteers descended on the beaches to brave the icy water to help fellow creatures in trouble. The feelings these animals bring out in the human race can only be the best kind of feelings. And although 20 of them have died so far, these people hope and say they will save the rest of them. It has now been more than 12 hours since the whales were discovered. The volunteers were feeling tired and cold, but their job wasn't finished yet. It was time to try to release the animals back into the wild. 
and as the whales were being prepared for that release, the questions asked, why travel hundreds of miles to stand in the icy ocean, holding onto an animal that may either die or swim away without so much as a goodbye and thanks for the hand? Oh, I just didn't give a hand, that's all. Boy. <laughs> We're in the human race. I suppose we've got to help a little bit, haven't we? Oh, heard it on the radio. And I came down from yelling up. Yeah? Yeah. 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 We want to save them. Why do you want to save the whale? No. I think it's just that they're related more to people, I think, than, uh, <laughs> than we are. <laughs> First of all, I think that whales do have a particular appeal for human beings. I think that probably they're depicted in story and history as the least ferocious of animals. Dr Julia Solomon is a clinical psychologist. She says it's the whale's apparent gentleness which is the key. There's something about a whale on outward appearance that doesn't have a fearful aspect. Uh, you don't seem to have an impression that if you, if you started to fight with a whale that it would have many uh, weapons against a man, whereas if you think about a kangaroo and a cat, they do. So I guess man feels comfortable. But that's not the end of it. She says the whale has a romance about it which no other animal has. Then there's the drama of being involved in the rescue. It's a question that you ask, why do men and women, I guess, walk as far as they do, go as far as they do, and put themselves at some risk uh, there's a romance in that. There's, there's a hero story in that. Heroes? Well, maybe they are, but I don't think that's why they came. Not consciously, anyway. No, it's the feeling of being able to help, of just being there. Ask anyone who stood for hours chest deep in the icy water, nursing a whale, and they'll tell you there's nothing like it. Magic happens and a bond is formed. I know the, the whales are certainly scared, and they're certainly um, in, in considerable pain, I would imagine. Judging from their behaviour, when, when people are quiet and move gently around them and handle them, they, they certainly um, comfort from, from the way people handle them and, and the way you know, that they're, they're, they're looked after and positioned on the beach. But is there more than that? Many people will tell you yes. The question is then, does communication flow between man and beast, or is it pure fantasy? Is it? I've been to strandings, I've handled whales and dolphins, and I suggest that, and I've surfed with dolphins, I've swum with dolphins, I suggest that anybody that um, would like to discuss that one with me would have to go and do this first and then come back and talk to me about it. Either way, the end result is the same. The animals are released back into the wild. But not this time. It soon became obvious they were still disoriented and the release was called off. I think our students failed that test. We've certainly got a couple of strong swimmers, but uh, the number of animals that uh, are unable to maintain themselves in an upright uh, position are too great. So it looked like a long night for whales and humans alike though both would gain something from the experience. Once that sort of bond is made, um, once that contact's made, the emotion flows between the two, and they know when we're trying to help them. We know when they're frightened, panic-stricken. That's what I mean in communication. Um, communication doesn't have to be spoken. It was a long, cold night, and an even colder morning. For the volunteers, it seemed as if the sun would never rise and warm their chilled bodies. But by the time the sun broke through, it was obvious to all concerned the night's rest had done the whales a power of good. And the decision was made to try again to let the animals go. What we'll do is the same as yesterday, deploy forward riders 
to uh, cut off the reef. Uh, we'll try and keep the opening to that channel clear at all times with uh, swimmers moving from the back of that uh, channel very slowly and very quietly. Uh, we'll try not to get in amongst the whales or cut off their escape or access back to sea if we can uh, possibly help it. There was an air of expectancy as the volunteers, still tired now from two nights without sleep, began to prepare themselves and their newfound friends for release. As the board riders and wave skiers made their way out, almost as if they knew what was happening, the whales became restless. Close the channel a bit tighter. Keep it quiet, just stay quiet, let him through. It's the noise, you don't want it this way, you want it that way. The whales were moving steadily forward now, some by themselves, others still needing a helping hand. Looks like they're on their way. Thanks fellas, you want to start moving back in? Well done. It's pretty exciting, the whales kept, um, the tails were just quivering and so the tails kept sinking and we had to, you know, dive down and pick them up again and try and get them going. And then they just kept turning back and back and back all the time. Finally, they um, decided to go by the looks of things. Well, it was a couple of times when they wanted to come back in, but we just kept pushing them out. And it was a couple of weak ones, but they took off as well, so it was great. And a lot of them were sinking down, um, waterlogged. We had to bring a few in, but got them all right, and they took off out to sea. So after three days on the beach, the whales were heading back to where they belonged, or at least that's what everybody thought. We thank you very much for your assistance. It's been invaluable and uh, once again has proved to be uh, the, uh, the reason for the success. Without it, uh, there's just no way in the world that we would have got these animals back to sea. While it seemed things were going well and that the release had been a success, in reality, fate was about to strike a cruel blow. All of a sudden, as if on cue, the whales stopped swimming. They went under the boat and just hung there, as if talking with each other, as if they'd paused to make a decision. Just then, a huge rain squall blew in from the southwest and hit the boat and board riders. Almost at the same time, the whales reached a collective decision, turned and headed towards the shore again. By now, the rescuers were in the middle of a storm, and the rescue boat had to turn its attention away from the whales and to the stranded humans. It was the height of irony, as nature had played a cruel trick on the congregation, and the rescuers became the rescued. The humans safe, it was a mad dash to try to stop the inevitable, to head the whales off. But they were too late. Head first up the beach, we'll use the surf one at a time, get them up there. So right this one out. It was living chaos. People couldn't believe their eyes. The whales thrashing, confused, disoriented, and struggling for breath. Their dreams of returning the whales had turned into the worst kind of nightmare. And as the whales floundered and struggled for breath, the battle to save them was on again.
It was enough to break even the hardest of hearts, seeing those creatures tossed together like sardines. For some, it was too much to bear. But still the rescuers battled on. It took more than an hour of hard labor to get the whales out of the water and onto dry land. The death toll had risen again. Another two had died. Almost totally exhausted now, the volunteers were on the edge of collapse, desperate to know what they should do next to save these lost angels. I can't say what I really felt on, on, on this, but I was uh, bloody angry, frustrated, um, disappointed, I nearly cried, I suppose. This is George. I've been looking after him since Thursday. Do you think he's going to get through? I think so. He's strong. He was strong when he went out. He was a lot better than he was last night, but, you know, it's just a tragedy. They've turned back in again. Ever since he beat himself, because he was the first one to beat himself, um, I've just been with him, keeping him warm. But it's good that we got him out of the water so he doesn't keep swallowing the salt water. It has now been two days and two nights since the rescue began. If it was going to be successful, then it had to be concluded, and soon. The same strategy will apply in terms of getting the animals out of this holding area as applied this morning, over that side, uh, between the whales or the channel. In a matter of hours, the whales had got their second wind and were ready for a third release attempt. Once again, board riders were in the water, ready to act as shepherds to this extraordinary flock. A weakened whale was strapped to the side of the boat to act as a lure. Can we slip him a little bit further back so there's a bit of free bag at the front? That keeps the water off. A helicopter was deployed in the hope the noise it made would keep the animals away from the land. But would it be enough? had done all they could. As they turned for home, the whales too were heading in the right direction. But there was one last scare for the rescue coordinators. This time, the decision the whales made was the right one, and jubilantly, the wildlife officers followed them out to sea. were back where they belong. Hello. 
While the rescuers were celebrating, before the white man came to this land, these wails would have resulted in a celebration of a different kind. For 40,000 years, the Aborigines have sung this land, and during that time, there must have been hundreds, if not thousands, of beachings. It's estimated before the white man came with his harpoon, more than 20,000 humpback whales swarmed off the West Australian coast. When whaling was outlawed a decade or so ago, there were fewer than 800 left. The whales, in fact, were so numerous, they found their way into Aboriginal dream time and into Aboriginal song. What's the song about? The whale. The song about the whale. The song about the whale. He says well, it's a song about uh, the whale feeding say, and a celebration yeah, of the I gift of the whale to the Aboriginal the people would... by the Creator. <laughs> but unlike the white people who struggled to save the whale, yes. once upon a time, these whales would have been eaten at a huge corroboree. And whatever sea people touch them, when they touch them, push their help, everything, what in the seaside, they give it a bit to play, you know, whatever it is, whales and turtles and everything. That's along with the sea people. Algie Patterson like isn't a sea person, but he says there are stories in his tribe's dream time which tell of the sea people inviting his ancestors to a great feast after a huge whale or tanganilla had beast itself. There are similar stories all along the coastline, including Perth's Nungas. Whale is, and it, 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 it represents a very big um, part. And in the old days down here, they used to tell the story of how the whale uh, used to come down every season. They used to come back down here and uh, how they used to go up. Again, like Algy Patterson, Ken Colbung says in the days before the white man, the whale would have been seen by his ancestors as a gift from God. It's called Wardundi, and the Wardundi people, the coastal people, were the owners of that uh, rights for that land in, in that area. It was just like when you cut off the top of the belt or the black boy tree, you have the rights for the bardies or widgety grubs in them, and um, the, um, the same thing with the whale. If he landed on your beach, well, you have the rights to the meat and you can invite who you like. Into the he says had the Augusta beaching happened 200 years ago, his ancestors would have eaten and eaten until they couldn't they eat anymore. They'd feed on, they'd call in people from everywhere then. It depended on how many whales were there, how many people came down for the feast. As for whether the white people are doing the right thing by saving the whales, Ken says he doesn't know. On one hand, he says they're giving the whales a second chance, and that's just fine. But on the other, his instincts tell him they're messing with nature and things they don't understand. I don't believe that perhaps that was a wrong thing because they, they were messing around with what the um, uh, creator was sending to them. And so if, if the creator was sending that to them, why should people then be disrespectful and throw it back? The Nungar chief says they were throwing a gift back into God's face. But the rescuers wouldn't have been aware of that. They were also unaware of the last trick Mother Nature was to play on them. A trick so cruel it would break some people's hearts and turn rescuer against rescuer. It was early the next morning when the wildlife officers made a search of the beaches. They were taking no chances on missing any whale that may have rebeast itself. They travelled more than 25 miles along the beach looking for signs. Gale force winds created rough seas and a rough ride. Then someone spotted something. Hearts pounded against chests as the worst was feared. The helicopter was put down for a closer inspection. Once on the ground, a total of 19 whales were found, but thankfully, none was from the pod which had been released the day before. These whales had been on the beach for between three and five days, and they were in a terrible condition.
And again, that nagging question, what makes them do it? Could it have been those gently sloping beaches of Augusta confusing them? Or the storms which had raged for days before? Or was it because of the high level of heavy metals and man-made chemicals found in the dead whales? Dave Mell was the wildlife officer in charge of the rescue operation. It's too early in um, our stage of data collection for us to have a good understanding of what is uh, a natural level of um, heavy metals uh, in animals. Uh, as you know, um, elements of heavy metals such as mercury are uh, uh, in the natural environment and they probably pick those up through a natural sequence of, of feeding within their environment. Uh, the pesticides is uh, obviously an entirely different issue. They're man-originated substances that are somehow getting into the marine environment and are being picked up through prey uh, animals and uh, accumulating. But surely it's logical to believe, pound for pound, it can't be that much different for us. Statistics show since 1790 there have been 1,200 strandings, some involving hundreds of creatures. The disturbing thing is, more than two-thirds have happened since the mid-1950s. This corner of Australia is farmland, with a high level of chemical runoff. Whether those chemicals had anything to do with the beachings or not, we'll never know. As for these whales, a decision had to be made on their future. I think you really had to be there to appreciate the circumstances which they were in. They were uh, well up from the waterline, the, many of them were half buried in sand, there was uh, 40 knot winds blowing and the animals were being s s sandblasted. Um, they were certainly dehydrated and uh, the vet's uh, assessment of the anim animals indicated that their reflexes were not good, their breathing rates were not good. Um, and so for the sake of the animals, I really don't think there was any choice. The most humane thing we can do is to uh, put them out of their suffering. Um, uh, an attempt to release them at this stage is, is really not advisable. The logistics of getting people in here is, is almost impossible and the whales are suffering a great deal now and have a very poor chance of survival. How do you feel about having to make that decision? Oh, absolutely terrible, but um, I think we have to quite simply keep it realistic. We have to bear the, the interests of the animal at heart. The animal is the most important thing here and I think the decision has to be based entirely on that. There was only one way out and there wasn't a dry eye on the beach. The bottom line is this. If it only takes one sick whale to cause a pod of perhaps hundreds to become stranded, and if that one animal is sick or worse, deformed because of the action of man, then we must listen to our consciences. I want to speak to a whale. I don't think I want a whale to speak to me because I feel the first question that that whale would ask me would be why. And I don't think I would like to be the one that would have to try to answer. So it seems there are a number of reasons why the whales lose their way and beast themselves. And those reasons fall into two categories. They're either man-made or they're natural. If they're natural, there's little we can or should do about it. But if they're man-made, then we need to act and act soon. Governments of the world are concerned about our dwindling fish stocks. They say we're overfishing the oceans. But wait, couldn't there be another reason? Every day we dump millions and millions of tonnes of poisons into the oceans and we don't know what those poisons are doing. The experts say the oceans are the world's last great mystery, so how can we know what they're doing? West Australians saved 33 whales at Augusta. It's time we did our bit. It's time we stopped and thought about what we're doing to the oceans before it's too late, before the sun sets forever on the creatures down under.